September. Monday. I guess Mom was pretty proud of herself for making me write in that journal last year, because now she went and bought me another one. But remember how I said that if some jerk caught me carrying a book with diary on the cover, they were going to get the wrong idea? Well, that's exactly what happened today. My brother Roderick caught me with it. Now that he knows I have another journal, I better remember to keep this one locked up. Roderick actually got a hold of my last journal a few weeks back, and it was a disaster. But don't even get me started on that story. Even without my Roderick problems, my summer was pretty lousy. Our family didn't go anywhere or do anything fun, and that's Dad's fault. Dad made me join the swim team again, and he wanted to make sure I didn't miss any meets this year. Dad's got this idea that I'm destined to be a great swimmer or something, so that's why he makes me join the team every summer. At my first swim meet a couple of years ago, Dad told me that when the umpire shot off the starter pistol, I was supposed to dive in and start swimming. But what he didn't tell me was that the starter gun only fired blanks. So I was a whole lot more worried about where the bullet was going to land than I was about getting myself to the other end of the pool, so I just dove to the bottom. Even after Dad explained the whole starter pistol concept to me, I was still the worst swimmer on the team. But I did end up winning Most Improved at the awards banquet at the end of the summer. That's only because there was a ten-minute difference between my first race and my last one. So I guess Dad's still waiting for me to live up to my potential. In a lot of ways, being on the swim team was worse than being in middle school. First of all, we had to be at the pool by 7.30 every morning, and the water was always freezing cold. And second of all, we were all crammed into two lanes— so I always had somebody on my tail trying to get around me. The reason we had to use two lanes was because swim practice was at the same time as the water jazz class. I actually tried to convince Dad to let me do water jazz instead of swim team, but he wouldn't go for it. This was the first summer the coach let us boys wear swim trunks instead of those skimpy racing trunks. But Mom said Roderick's hand-me-down bathing suit was perfectly fine. She said, Your friends will be jealous because you'll be so fast. Yeah, right. They had a good laugh on me. After swim practice, Roderick would pick me up in his band's van. Mom had this crazy idea that if me and Roderick spent quality time on the ride home every day, we wouldn't fight as much. But all it did was make things a lot worse. Roderick was always a half hour late picking me up, and he wouldn't let me sit up front. He said the chlorine would ruin his seat, even though the van is something like 15 years old. Roderick's van doesn't actually have any seats in the back, so I had to squeeze in with all the band equipment. And every time the van came to a stop, I had to pray I didn't get my head taken off by one of Roderick's drums. I ended up walking home every day instead of getting a ride from Roderick. I figured it was better to just walk the two miles than to get brain damage riding in the back of that van. Halfway through the summer, I decided I was pretty much done with swim team. So I came up with a trick to get out of practice. I'd swim a few laps, and then I'd ask the coach if I could use the bathroom. Then, I'd just hide out in the locker room until practice was over. The only problem with my plan was that it was something like 40 degrees in the boys' bathroom so it was even colder in there than it was in the pool. I had to wrap myself up in toilet paper so I didn't get hypothermia. That's how I spent a pretty big chunk of my summer vacation, and that's why I'm actually looking forward to going back to school tomorrow. Tuesday When I got to school today, everybody was acting all strange around me, and at first, I didn't know what was up. Then I remembered. I still had the cheese touch from last year. I got the cheese touch in the last week of school, and over the summer I completely forgot about it. The problem with the cheese touch 
is that you've got it until you pass it on to someone else. But nobody would even get within 30 feet of me, so I knew I was going to be stuck with the cheese touch for the whole school year. Luckily, there was a new kid named Jeremy Pindle in homeroom, so that took care of that problem. He got the cheese touch so fast, he didn't know what hit him. My first class was pre-algebra, and the teacher put me right next to Alex Aruda, the smartest kid in the whole class. Alex is super easy to copy off of because he always finishes his test early and puts his paper down on the floor next to him. So if I ever get in a pinch, it's nice to know I can count on Alex to bail me out. Kids whose last names start with the first few letters of the alphabet get called on the most by the teacher, and that's why they end up being the smartest. Some people think that's not true, but if you want to come down to my school, I can prove it. Just look at Christopher Ziegel. I can only think of one kid who broke the last name rule, and that's Peter Utiger. Peter was the smartest kid in the class all the way up until the fifth grade. That's when a bunch of us started giving him a hard time about how his initials sounded when you said them out loud. P-U, P-U, P-U. These days, Peter doesn't raise his hand at all and he's pretty much a C student. I guess I feel a little bad about the whole P.U. thing and what happened to Peter, but it's hard not to take credit whenever it comes up. Anyway, today I got pretty decent seats in all my classes except seventh period history. My teacher is Mr. Huff, and something tells me he had Roderick as a student a few years back. He put me in a chair next to his desk. Wednesday. Mom has been making me and Roderick help out more around the house, and now the two of us are responsible for doing the dishes every night. The rule is that we're not allowed to watch any TV or play video games until all the dishes are done. But let me just say that Roderick is the worst dishes partner in the world. As soon as dinner is over, he goes upstairs to the bathroom and camps out there for an hour. And by the time he comes back downstairs, I'm already done. But if I ever complain to Mom and Dad, Roderick always pulls out the same lame excuse. He says, My body is on a schedule. I think Mom and Dad are too worried about my little brother, Manny, to get involved in a fight between me and Roderick right now anyway. Yesterday, Manny drew a picture at daycare and Mom and Dad got really upset when they found it in his backpack. It was of two angry yelling people and one little crying guy. Mom and Dad thought the picture was supposed to be of them, so now they're acting all lovey in front of Manny. I love you so much. And I love you so much. I knew who it was really supposed to be in the picture. Me and Roderick. We got into a big blowout over the remote control the other night, and Manny was there to witness the whole thing. But Mom and Dad don't need to find out about that. Thursday Another reason my summer was kind of lame was because my best friend, Rowley, was on vacation pretty much the whole time. I think he went to South America or something. But to be honest with you, I'm not really sure. I don't know if this makes me a bad person or whatever, but it's hard for me to get interested in other people's vacations. Besides, it seems like Rowley's family is always traveling to some crazy place in the world, and I can never keep their trips straight. The other reason I don't care about Rowley's trips is because whenever Rowley comes back from one of his vacations, he always crams it down my throat. Last year, Rowley and his family went to Australia for ten days but from the way he acted when he got back, you'd think he lived there his whole life. He came over to see me, and when I opened the door, he said, Good day, mate. Another thing that's really annoying is that whenever Rowley goes to some new country, he gets into whatever fad is going on over there. Like when Rowley got back from Europe two years ago, he got hooked on this pop singer named Joshi, who I guess is some huge star or something. So Rowley came back with his bags full of Joshi CDs and posters and stuff. I took one look at the picture on the CD 
and told Rowley that Joshi was supposed to be for six-year-old girls. But he didn't believe me. Rowley said I was just jealous because he was the one who discovered Joshi. And what made it really irritating was that now this guy was Rowley's new hero. So if I ever tried to say anything critical at all, Rowley didn't want to hear it. He'd say things like, Joshi says you should respect your parents and follow your dreams. Speaking of foreign countries, today in French class, Madame Lefrère told us we're going to be choosing pen pals this year. When Roderick was in middle school, he had a 17-year-old girl from Holland as his pen pal. I know because I've seen the letters in his junk drawer. One said, I like the sunshiny days and ice cream. Do you too? Signed with a heart. When Madame Lefrère handed out the forms, I made sure I checked off the boxes that would get me a pen pal just like Roderick's. But after Madame Lefrère read over my form, she made me start over and pick again. She said I had to choose a boy who is my age and he has to be French. So I don't exactly have high hopes for my pen pal experience. Friday. Mom decided to start making Roderick pick me up after school, just like he picked me up after swim practice. I guess that means she didn't learn from that experience. But I did. So when Roderick picked me up today, I asked him to please take it easy on the brakes. Roderick said okay, but then he went out of his way to find every speed bump in town. Ouch. When I got out of the van, I called Roderick a big jerk, and then it got physical. Mom saw the whole thing unfold from the living room window. Mom made us come inside, and she sat us down at the kitchen table. Then she said me and Roderick were going to have to settle our differences in a civil manner. Mom told me and Roderick we each had to write down what we did wrong, and then we had to draw a picture to go along with it and I knew exactly where Mom was going with that idea. Mom used to be a preschool teacher, and whenever a kid would do something wrong, she'd make him draw a picture of it. I guess the idea was to make the kid feel ashamed of what he did so he wouldn't do it again. Well, Mom's idea might have worked great on a bunch of four-year-olds, but she's going to have to think of something better if she wants me and Roderick to get along. The truth is, Roderick can pretty much treat me any way he wants because he knows there's nothing I can do about it. See, Roderick is the only one who knows about this really embarrassing thing that happened to me over the summer, and he's been holding it over my head ever since. So if I ever tell on him for anything, he'll spill my secret to the whole world. I just wish I had some dirt on him to even things out. I do know one embarrassing thing about Roderick but I don't think it's going to do me any good. When Roderick was a sophomore, he was sick the day they did school photos. So Mom told Dad to mail in Roderick's freshman picture for the school to use in the yearbook. Don't ask me how Dad screwed this up, but he sent in Roderick's second grade picture. And believe it or not, it actually got printed. Unfortunately, Roderick was smart enough to rip that page out of his yearbook. So if I'm ever going to find something to use against him, I guess I have to keep digging. Wednesday Ever since Mom assigned the dishes to me and Roderick, Dad's been going down to the furnace room after dinner to work on this miniature Civil War battlefield of his. Dad spends at least three hours a night down there working on that thing. I think Dad would be happy to spend the whole weekend working on his battlefield. But Mom has other plans for him. Mom likes to rent these romantic comedies, and she makes Dad watch them with her. But I know Dad is just waiting for the first chance to break away and go back down to the basement. Whenever Dad can't be down in the furnace room, he makes sure us kids keep away from it. Dad won't let me or Roderick go near his battlefield, because he thinks we're going to mess something up. And earlier today, I overheard Dad say something to Manny to make sure he doesn't go poking around back there either. Can you believe it? He actually said, 
I think I just heard some grunting noises coming from the furnace room. Saturday Rowley came over to my house today. Dad doesn't like it when Rowley comes over, because Dad always says Rowley is accident-prone. I think it's because this one time Rowley was eating dinner here, and he dropped a plate and broke it. So now Dad has this idea that Rowley is going to ruin his whole Civil War battlefield in one klutzy move. Whenever Rowley comes over to my house these days, he gets the same greeting. The basement is off limits. Rowley's dad doesn't like me either. That's why I don't go over to his house much anymore. The last time I spent the night at Rowley's, we watched this movie where some kids taught themselves a secret language that no grown-ups could understand. Me and Rowley thought that was pretty cool, and we tried to figure out how to talk in the same language the kids were using in the movie. But we couldn't really get the hang of it, so we made up our own secret language. Then, I tried it out at dinner. Your pa dad pa smells pa like pa a woman pa. But Rowley's dad must have cracked our code, because I ended up getting sent home before dessert. And I haven't been invited to spend the night at Rowley's ever since. When Rowley came over to my house today, he brought a bunch of pictures from his trip with him. He said the best part of his vacation was when they went on a river safari, and he showed me all these blurry pictures of birds and stuff. Now, I've been to the Wild Kingdom amusement park a bunch of times, and they have this river rapids ride where they have these awesome robot animals like gorillas and dinosaurs. If you ask me, Rowley's parents should have just saved their money and taken him there instead. I asked Rowley, did you see any sharks fighting giant tarantulas on your safari? And he said, no, and sharks don't fight tarantulas. Well, at Wild Kingdom they do. But of course, Rowley didn't want to hear about my experiences, so he just gathered up his pictures and went back home. Tonight after dinner, Mom made Dad watch one of the movies she rented. But Dad really wanted to work on his Civil War battlefield. When Mom got up to go to the bathroom, Dad stuffed a bunch of pillows under the blanket on his side of the bed to make it look like he was asleep. Mom didn't find out about Dad's decoy until after the movie was over. Sure enough, she found him downstairs. She made Dad come to bed, even though it was only 8.30. And now Manny sleeps in Mom and Dad's bed, because he's afraid of the monster that lives in the furnace room. Tuesday I thought I was done hearing about Rowley's trip, but I was wrong. Yesterday, our social studies teacher asked Rowley to tell the class all about his vacation, and today he came to school wearing this ridiculous costume. But what was even worse was when some girls came up to Rowley at lunch and started kissing his butt, asking about his trip to South America. But then I realized maybe that wasn't such a bad thing after all. So I started parading Rowley around the cafeteria, because after all, he is my best friend. Saturday Dad has been taking me to the mall every Saturday for the past few weeks. At first, I thought it was because he wanted to spend more time with me. But then I realized he's just making sure he's out of the house for Roderick's band practices, which I can totally understand. Roderick and his heavy metal band practice in the basement on weekends. The lead singer of the band is this guy named Bill Walter, and me and Dad bumped into Bill on the way out the door today. Morning, Mr. Halfley, Bill said. Bill doesn't have a job, and he still lives with his parents, even though he's 35 years old. I'm pretty sure Dad's worst fear is that Roderick is going to see Bill as some kind of role model, and that Roderick will want to follow in Bill's footsteps. So whenever Dad sees Bill... It just puts him in a bad mood for the rest of the day. Roderick invited Bill to be in his band was because Bill got voted most likely to be a rock star when he was in high school, along with Anna Rentham.
That hasn't really worked out for Bill yet. And I think I heard Anna Rentham is in prison. Anyway, me and Dad went to the mall for a few hours today. But when we got back, Roderick's band practice wasn't over yet. You could hear the guitars and drums from a block away, and there were a bunch of random teenagers hanging out in our driveway. I guess they must have heard the music coming out of the basement and got drawn to it. Sort of like how moths get drawn to a light. When Dad saw all those teenagers in the driveway, he totally freaked out. Dad ran inside to call the cops, but Mom stopped him before he could dial 911. Mom said those teenagers weren't doing any harm and that they were just appreciating Roderick's music. But I don't even know how she could say that with a straight face. And if you ever heard Roderick's band, you'd know what I mean. Dad couldn't relax with all those teenagers out in our driveway. So Dad went upstairs and got his boombox. Then he put in a classical music CD and let it play. And you would not believe how quickly the driveway cleared out after that. Dad was pretty proud of himself for thinking of that one. But Mom accused him of getting rid of Roderick's fans on purpose. Dad said, What? I can't enjoy my music too? Sunday. Today on the car ride to church, I was making faces at Manny, trying to get him to laugh. I made this one face that made Manny laugh so hard that apple juice came out of his nose. But then Mom said, You could have killed him. Well, once Mom put that thought in Manny's head, it was all over. He started to bawl. See, this is the reason I keep my distance from Manny. Every time I try to have a little fun with him, I end up regretting it. I remember when I was younger, and Mom and Dad told me I was getting a little brother, I was really excited. After all those years of getting pushed around by Roderick, I was definitely ready to move up a notch on the totem pole. But Mom and Dad have always been super protective of Manny, and they won't let me lay a finger on him, even if he totally deserves it. Like the other day, I plugged in my video game system, and it wouldn't start. I opened it up and found out that Manny had stuffed the chocolate chip cookie in the disk drive. And of course, Manny used the same excuse he always uses when he breaks my stuff. I'm only three. I really wanted to let Manny have it, but I couldn't do anything with Mom standing right there. Mom said she would have a talk with Manny, and they went downstairs. A half hour later, they came back up to my room, and Manny was holding something in his hands. He said, I'm sorry, Bobby, and handed it to me. It was a ball of tinfoil with a bunch of toothpicks sticking out of it. Don't ask me how that was supposed to make up for my broken video game system. I went to throw the stupid thing away, but Mom wouldn't even let me do that. She said, Your brother made that for you. The first chance I get, that thing's going in the trash. Because mark my words, if I don't get rid of it, I'm going to end up sitting on it. Even though Manny drives me totally nuts, there is one reason I like having him around. Ever since Manny started talking, Roderick has stopped making me sell chocolate bars for his school fundraisers. And believe me, I'm grateful for that. He makes Manny do it because he's cute. Before, Roderick would make me go up to a house and say, Um, hello, sir. Would you like to help support? Not interested. And the door would slam in my face. Now, Manny goes up to houses. Would you like some chocolates? How precious. And they fork over their dough. Monday. Madame Lefrere made us write our first pen pal letters today. I got assigned to this kid named Mamadou Montpierre, and I guess he lives someplace in France. I know I'm supposed to write in French and Mamadou is supposed to write in English, but to be honest with you, writing in a foreign language is pretty hard. So I really don't see the need for both of us to stress out over this whole pen pal thing. My first letter to him said, Dear Mamadou, 
First of all, I think we should both just write in English to keep things simple. By the way, remember how I said I was going to end up sitting on Manny's spiky tinfoil ball thing? Well, I was half right. Rowley came over today to play video games, and he ended up sitting on it. I'm actually kind of relieved, to be honest with you. I lost track of that thing a couple of days ago, and I'm just glad it finally turned up. And in all the commotion, I threw Manny's gift in the garbage. But something tells me Mom wouldn't have stopped me this time. Wednesday Roderick has an English paper due tomorrow, and Mom's actually making him do it himself for once. Roderick doesn't know how to type, so he usually writes his papers out on notebook paper and then hands them off to Dad. But when Dad reads over Roderick's work, he finds all sorts of factual errors. Like, well, for starters, Abraham Lincoln didn't write To Kill a Mockingbird. Roderick doesn't really care about the mistakes, so he tells Dad to just go ahead and type the paper like it is. But Dad can't stand typing a paper with errors in it, so he just rewrites Roderick's paper from scratch. And then a couple days later, Roderick brings his graded paper home and acts like he did it himself. This has been going on for a few years, and I guess Mom decided she's going to put an end to it. So tonight she told Dad that Roderick was going to have to do his own work this time around, and that Dad wasn't allowed to help out. Roderick went in the computer room after dinner, and you could hear him typing about one letter a minute. I could tell the sound of Roderick typing was driving Dad totally bananas. On top of that, Roderick would come out of the computer room every ten minutes and ask Dad some dumb question, like, Where's the space bar again? After a couple of hours, Dad finally cracked. Dad waited for Mom to go to bed, and then he typed Roderick's whole paper for him. So I guess this means Roderick's system is safe. At least for now. I have a book report due tomorrow, but I'm really not sweating it. I found the secret to doing book reports a long time ago. I've been milking the same book for the past five years. Sherlock Sammy does it again. There are about 20 short stories in Sherlock Sammy Does It Again, but I just treat each story like it's a whole book, and the teacher never notices. These Sherlock Sammy stories are all the same. Some grown-up commits a crime, and then Sherlock Sammy figures it out and makes the person look stupid. I'm kind of an expert at writing book reports by now. All you have to do is write exactly what the teacher wants to hear, and you're all set. Things like, Man, Sherlock Sammy is so smart, and I'll bet that's because he reads so many books. And the teacher would comment on my paper, I'll bet you're right. There were a bunch of hard words in this book, but I looked them up in the dictionary, so now I know what they mean. I guess you're a bit of a sleuth yourself. A+. plus. October Monday. There was a kid named Chirag Gupta who was one of my friends last year, but he moved away in June. His family had a big going away party, and the whole neighborhood came. But I guess Chirag's family must have changed their mind, because today Chirag was back in school. Everyone was happy to see Chirag again, but a couple of us decided to have a little fun with him before officially welcoming him back. So we basically pretended he was still gone. We go, Boy, I sure do miss Chirag. Yeah, I wonder how he's doing. And he'd go, Hey guys, I'm right here. I have to admit, it was pretty funny. At lunch, Chirag sat next to me. I had an extra chocolate chip cookie in my lunch bag, and I made a big deal about it. I said, I wish Chirag was here. Oh, how he loved chocolate chip cookies. I'm not even that hungry. And Chirag said, But I'm sitting right next to you. Okay, so maybe that one was a little cruel. I guess we'll probably let Chirag off the hook tomorrow. But then again, this invisible Chirag thing could turn into the next P.U. Tuesday. 
Okay, so the invisible Chirag joke is still going, and the whole class is in on it now. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself or anything, but I think I might have class clown in the bag for dreaming this one up. In science, the teacher asked me to count the number of kids in the classroom so she'd know how many pairs of safety goggles to get out of the closet. So I made a big show of counting everyone in the room except Chirag. Thirty-three. Thirty-four. There are thirty-four people in this class. Well, that really set Chirag off. He got up and started yelling, and it was really hard to stare straight ahead and act like he wasn't there. He screamed in my face. I am a human being, too. I wanted to tell him that we never said he wasn't a human being. It's just that he's an invisible human being. But I managed to keep my mouth shut. Before you go and say I'm a bad friend for teasing Chirag, let me just say this in my own defense. I'm smaller than about 95% of the kids at my school, so when it comes to finding someone I can actually pick on, my options are pretty limited. And besides, I'm not 100% to blame for dreaming up this idea. Believe it or not, I got the idea from Mom. This one time, when I was a kid, I was playing under the kitchen table, and Mom came looking for me. Has anyone seen Gregory? I don't know what made me do it, but I decided to play a joke on Mom and stay hidden. Mom went all around the house calling my name. I think she must have finally seen me under the kitchen table, but she still pretended she didn't know where I was. She looked out the window and sighed. Poor Gregory, all alone in the snow. I thought it was pretty funny, and I probably would have stayed hidden under there for a little while more. But Mom finally got me to crack when she said she was going to give my gumball machine to Roderick. So if you want to point fingers on the invisible Chirag joke, now you know who's really to blame. Thursday Well, yesterday, Chirag pretty much gave up on trying to get anyone in our class to talk to him. But today, he found our weakness. He came up to Rowley and said, Rowley, do you think I exist? And the idiot said back, Nope, I can't even hear you or see you. I forgot all about Rowley. When the joke first started up, I made sure to keep him away from Chirag, because I had a feeling Rowley would blow the joke. But I guess I kind of got too cocky and let my guard down. Chirag started working on Rowley at lunch, and he came really close to getting him to crack. He told Rowley, If you say I exist, this corn dog is yours. I could tell Rowley was about to say something, so I had to act quick. I told everyone there was a floating corn dog hovering above our lunch table, and then I plucked it out of the air and ate it in two bites. So, thanks to my quick thinking, we were able to keep the joke going. But that really made Chirag mad. He started punching my arm. But of course, I had to pretend like I didn't notice. And let me tell you, that wasn't easy to do. Chirag might be small, but that kid can really punch. Friday. Well, I guess Chirag must have complained to a teacher about my little joke, because today I got called down to the front office. When I got to Vice Principal Roy's room, he was pretty mad. He knew all about how I started the joke, and he gave me a speech about respect and decency and all that. But luckily, Mr. Roy got one crucial fact wrong, and that was the identity of the person we were playing the joke on. So that made the apology part a whole lot easier. Sharif was confused when I said, I am deeply sorry, and now I do indeed admit that you exist, Sharif. Mr. Roy seemed pretty satisfied with my apology, and he let me go without even tacking on any detention. I've always heard that when Mr. Roy is done chewing a kid out, he sends them off with a pat on the back and a lollipop. And now I can tell you firsthand that it's true. Saturday Rowley's birthday party is tomorrow, so Mom took me to the mall to get him a gift. I picked out this cool video game that just came out, and I handed it to Mom so she could pay for it. 
but Mom said I had to buy it with my own money. I told Mom that first of all, I have zero money. And second of all, if I did have any money, I wouldn't be wasting it on Rowley. Mom didn't seem too happy with what I said, but it's not my fault I'm broke. I actually had a job this summer, but the people I worked for stiffed me, so I didn't earn a single penny. We have these neighbors named the Fullers who live a few doors up, and they go away on vacation every summer. They usually leave their dog Princess in the kennel, but this year they told me they'd pay me five bucks a day to feed Princess and take her out. I figured I'd earn enough to buy a whole pile of video games with that kind of money. But I guess Princess is gun-shy about going to the bathroom in front of strangers, so I ended up spending a lot of time standing around in the hot sun waiting for this dumb dog to hurry up and go. I'd wait and wait, and nothing would happen, and then I'd just take Princess back inside. But every time I'd leave, Princess would make a big mess in the foyer, and I'd have to clean it up the next day. Toward the end of the summer, I got smart and realized it would be a whole lot easier to just clean up all of Princess's messes at once instead of doing it every single day. So I fed her and let her do her business on the foyer floor for about two weeks. Then, the day before the Fullers were due back, I headed up the hill with all my cleaning supplies. But guess what? The Fullers cut their trip short and got home a day early. I guess they didn't know it's polite to call ahead and let people know when your plans have changed. Tonight, Mom called a house meeting with me and Roderick. She said that the two of us are always complaining that we don't have any money, so she came up with a way for us to earn some cash. Then she pulled out some play money she must have dug up out of a board game, and she called the money Mom Bucks. Mom said we could earn mom bucks by doing chores and good deeds and stuff like that, and we could trade them in for real money. Mom handed us $1,000 each to get us started. I thought I had struck it rich, but then she explained that each mom buck was only worth a penny of real money. Mom told us how we should save up our mom bucks, and if we were patient, we could buy something we really wanted. But Roderick cashed in his whole stash before Mom was even done talking. Then he went down to the convenience store and blew his money on some heavy metal magazines. If Roderick wants to waste his money like that, he can go right ahead. But I'm going to be smart with my mom bucks. Sunday Today was Rowley's birthday party, and he had it at the mall. I'm sure I would have thought it was a lot of fun if I was about seven years old. That was the average age of the kids at Rowley's party. Rowley invited his whole karate team, and most of those kids are still in elementary school. I just wish I would have known what the party was going to be like so I could have skipped it. We started off playing these dopey party games, like pin the tail on the donkey and stuff like that. The last game we played was hide and seek. My plan was to just hide in the ball pit and stay there until the party was over. But some other kid was already in there. It turned out, this kid wasn't from Rowley's party. He was from the last birthday party that happened an hour earlier. I guess he must have hidden there during hide-and-seek, and nobody ever found him. So Rowley's party had to be put on hold while the staff tried to track down this kid's parents. After that situation got cleared up, we had cake and watched Rowley open his gifts. He mostly got a bunch of kids' toys, but he seemed pretty happy about it. Then, Rowley's parents gave him their present. And guess what? It was a diary. It kind of ticked me off, because I knew Rowley asked his parents for a diary so he could be just like me. After Rowley opened his present, he said, we can call ourselves the Diary Twins. I let him know exactly what I thought of that idea by slugging him in the arm. And I really don't care that it was his birthday, either. One thing I will say, though. I used to be mad at Mom for getting me a journal that looked too girly. I'm not so mad anymore. It actually said, Sweet Secrets Diary.
and had hearts on the cover. Lately, Rowley has been totally riding me. He reads the same comic books I read, drinks the same kind of soda I drink, you name it. Mom says I should be flattered. But to be honest with you, it's totally creeping me out. A couple days ago, I did an experiment to see just how far Rowley would go. I rolled up one of my pant legs and tied a bandana around my ankle and went to school that way. Sure enough, the next day, Rowley came to school wearing the same exact thing. And that's how I ended up in Vice Principal Roy's office for the second time in a week. An old lady had called up claiming there were some thugs outside her house sporting gang colors. Monday. I thought I was totally in the clear for the invisible Chirag thing, but boy was I wrong. Tonight, Mom got a call from Chirag's dad. Mr. Gupta told Mom all about the prank we were playing on his son and how I was the ringleader. When Mom questioned me, I told her I didn't even know what Chirag's dad was talking about. Then Mom marched me up to Rowley's house to hear what he had to say. Luckily, I was prepared for this kind of thing. I had already drilled Rowley on what to do if we ever got busted, and that if we both just denied everything, we'd be okay. But the second Mom started asking Rowley questions, he broke down. So after our visit to Rowley's house, Mom drove me over to Chirag's to apologize. And let me tell you, that wasn't a whole lot of fun. Mr. Gupta didn't seem too impressed with my apology. But believe it or not, Chirag was actually pretty cool about it. After I apologized, Chirag invited me inside to play video games. I think he was so relieved to finally have one of his classmates talking to him again that he just decided to forgive me for the whole incident. So, I guess I forgive him too. Tuesday Even though Chirag let me off the hook last night, Mom wasn't done with me yet. She wasn't really that mad about the joke or how I treated Chirag. She was just mad that I lied about it. So Mom told me she'll ground me for a month if she catches me lying again. And that means I better watch my step, because Mom's not going to forget what she said. When it comes to my screw-ups, Mom has a memory like an elephant. Like the other day, when I went to the refrigerator, Mom said... That's the second time you've tracked mud into the kitchen. The first time? Six years ago. Last year, Mom caught me lying, and I paid the price for it. Mom made a gingerbread house a week before Christmas, and she put it on top of the refrigerator. She said nobody was allowed to touch it until Christmas Eve dinner. But I couldn't help myself. So every night, I'd sneak downstairs and pick off a little piece of the gingerbread house, I tried to only eat a tiny piece each time so Mom wouldn't notice. It was really hard to limit myself to one gumdrop or one little crumb of gingerbread each night, but I managed to do it anyway. I didn't know how much I had actually eaten until Mom took it down off the fridge on Christmas Eve. When Mom accused me of eating all the candy, I denied it. But I wish I just fessed up right away, because that fib totally backfired on me. Mom had just gotten hired to write a parenting column for the local newspaper, and she was always looking for material. So that incident pretty much made me into a local celebrity. The article was called, When Your Child is Being Deceptive, by Susan Hefley. You know, now that I think about it, Mom isn't exactly squeaky clean when it comes to being honest herself. I remember when I was a kid, and she found out I wasn't brushing my teeth every night. She faked a call to the dentist's office. I heard her on the phone saying, Dr. Kratz, do you have dentures for little boys? Oh, only wooden ones? I guess that'll have to do then. And that call is the reason why I still brush my teeth four times a day. Friday. Well... It's been three days, and I've kept my promise to Mom. I've been 100% honest the whole time, and believe it or not, it's not that hard. In fact, it's kind of liberating. 
I've been in a couple of situations already where I was a lot more honest than I would have been a week ago. For example, the other day I had a conversation with this neighborhood kid named Sean Snella. He had said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a professional basketball player. And I had to tell him, think again, Sean. Neither one of your parents is taller than five foot two, and you're the only 200-pound six-year-old I know. Sean cried, but I couldn't tell a lie. And yesterday, Rowley's family had a birthday party for his grandfather. He had said, Next year, I want a chocolate cake. And I had to tell him, That is if you're alive next year. Hey, I was just trying to be realistic. Most people don't seem to appreciate a person as honest as me. So don't ask me how George Washington ever got to be president. Saturday Today I answered the phone, and it was Mrs. Gilman from the PTA looking for Mom. I tried to hand her the phone, but she whispered for me to tell Mrs. Gilman that she wasn't home. I couldn't tell if Mom was trying to trick me into lying or what, but there was no way I was going to break my honesty streak over something as dumb as this. So I made Mom go out on the front porch before I said, My mother is not inside the house right now. And from the look Mom gave me when she came back in the house, I kind of get the feeling she's not going to hold me to that honesty pledge anymore. Monday Today was career day at school. They have career day every year to get us kids to start thinking about our future. They brought in a bunch of adults who had all these different jobs. I think the idea is that us kids will find out about a job we like, and then we'll know what we want to be when we grow up. But what really happens is that you just find out which jobs to rule out. Because some of these grown-ups are such geeks. After the presentations, we had to fill out these questionnaires. The first question was, where do you see yourself in 15 years? I know exactly where I'll be in 15 years. In my pool, at my mansion, counting my money. But there weren't any checkboxes for that option. The questionnaires are supposed to predict what kind of job you're going to have when you grow up. When I was finished, I looked up my job on the chart, and I got clerk. Well, there must be something wrong with the way they set these forms up or something, because I don't know any clerks who are billionaires. Some other kids were unhappy with the jobs they ended up with, too. But the teacher said we shouldn't take these things too seriously. Well, try telling that to Edward Mealy. Last year, he got sanitation worker on his job chart, and the teachers have been treating him different ever since. I once heard a teacher say, Edward, could you please clean up this juice spill? Rowley got nurse on his job chart, and he seemed pretty happy about it. A couple of girls got nurse, too and they were chatting away with Rowley after class. Next year, I have to remember to sit next to Rowley and copy his job form so I can get in on some of that action. Saturday. Me and Roderick were just sitting around the house today, so Mom sent us over to Grandma's to rake her leaves. Mom said she'd pay us $100 in Mom bucks for each bag we filled. Plus... Grandma said she'd give us hot chocolate after we were finished. I really didn't feel like working on a Saturday, but I needed the cash. Besides, Grandma makes really awesome hot chocolate. So we got some rakes and plastic bags from our garage and headed down to Grandma's house. I took one side of the yard and Roderick took the other. But ten minutes into the job, Roderick came over and told me I was doing everything all wrong. Roderick said I was putting way too many leaves in each bag, and that if I just tied the bag closer to the bottom, I could get done a lot quicker. See, now this is the kind of advice you're supposed to get from your older brother. After Roderick showed me that trick, we went through bags like nobody's business. In fact, we ran out in half an hour. Grandma didn't seem too happy about forking over the hot chocolate when we came inside. But like they say, a deal's a deal. 
Monday. Ever since career day, Rowley has been spending lunch with a bunch of girls who sit at the corner table in the cafeteria. I guess the group of them is like the future nurses of America or something. Don't ask me what they talk about over there. They just whisper and giggle like a bunch of first graders. All I can say is, they better not be talking about me. You remember how I said Roderick is the only one who knows about that really embarrassing thing that happened to me over the summer? Well, Rowley knows the second most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me. And I really don't need him digging it back up. Back in fifth grade, we had a project in Spanish where we had to do a skit in front of the class, and my partner was Rowley. We had to do the whole skit in Spanish. Rowley asked me what I would do for a candy bar, and I said I'd stand on my head. But when I tried to do a headstand, I tipped over and my rear end went right through the wall. Estario parado en mi... ¡Ay, ay, ay! Well, the school never bothered to fix the hole. So for the rest of my time in elementary school, my butt print was on display in Mrs. Gonzalez's room. And if Rowley's spreading that story around... Believe me, I'm going to tell the whole world who ate the cheese. Wednesday Today I realized that if I wanted to know what Rowley and those girls are talking about at lunch, all I have to do is read his diary. I'll bet he's writing down all sorts of juicy gossip in that thing. The problem is, Rowley's diary is locked. So even if I got a hold of it, I wouldn't have any way to open it. But then I thought of something. All I had to do was buy the same exact diary he has, and then I'd have a key. So I went to the bookstore tonight and got the last one on the shelf. I just hoped buying this thing was worth it, because I had to cash in half of my mom bucks to pay for it. And I don't think Dad was too thrilled with the idea of me buying a sweet secrets diary either. Thursday. After phys ed today, I saw that Rowley accidentally left his diary on the bench. So when the coast was clear, I used my new key on his diary, and sure enough, it worked. I opened it up and started reading. Dear Diary, Today I played with my Dino Blazer action figures again. It was Mechorex versus Triceraclops, and Mechorex bited Triceraclops in the tail. And then Triceraclops turned around and said, Oh yeah? Well, how do you like that? And he shot Mechorex right in the hiney. I flipped through the rest of the book to see if my name was in there anywhere. But it was just page after page of this garbage. After seeing what's going on in Rowley's head, I'm kind of starting to wonder why I'm even friends with him in the first place. Saturday. Things at home have been really good for about a week. Roderick has the flu, so he doesn't have the energy to bother me. And Manny has been at Grandma's, so I've had the TV all to myself. Yesterday, Mom and Dad made a surprise announcement. They said they were going away for the night, and that me and Roderick were in charge of the house. That was some pretty big news, because Mom and Dad have never left me and Roderick on our own before. I think they've always been afraid that if they go away, Roderick is going to have a huge party and trash the house. But with Roderick knocked out with the flu, they must have seen their big chance. So after Mom gave us a speech about responsibility and trust and all that, they took off. The second Mom and Dad walked out the door, Roderick jumped up off of the couch and picked up the phone. Then he called every friend he knew and told them he was having a party. I thought about calling mom and dad to tell them what Roderick was up to, but I've never actually been to a high school party before, so I was curious. I decided to just keep my mouth shut and soak it all in. Roderick told me to get some folding tables out of the basement and bring a couple of bags of ice out of the downstairs freezer. Roderick's friends started to show up around 7 o'clock, and before you knew it, there were cars parked up and down the street. The first person to walk through the door was Roderick's friend Ward. 
A bunch more people started showing up after that, and Roderick told me we were going to need more tables, so I went downstairs to get them. But as soon as I stepped foot in the basement, I heard the door lock behind me. I pounded on the door, but Roderick just cranked up the music to drown me out. So I was stuck down there. Man, I should have known Roderick would go and pull something like that. I guess it was pretty dumb of me to think Roderick was going to let me in on the action. It sounded like it was a pretty wild party. I think some girls even showed up at one point. But I couldn't be too sure, because it was hard to keep track of what was going on from just looking at the bottoms of people's shoes through the crack at the bottom of the door. The party was still going strong at 2 a.m., but that's when I gave up. I spent the night on one of the spare beds in the basement, even though there were no blankets on it. I practically froze to death, but there was no way I was going to use a blanket from Roderick's bed. Somebody must have unlocked the basement door overnight, because when I woke up this morning, it was open. And when I walked upstairs, it looked like a tornado had touched down in the family room. The last of Roderick's friends wasn't gone until three in the afternoon, and once everyone left, Roderick told me I had to help him clean up. I told Roderick he was out of his mind if he thought I was helping, but then Roderick said that if he got busted for the party, he was taking me down with him. He said if I didn't help him clean up the mess, he would tell all my friends about the thing that happened to me this summer. I couldn't believe Roderick would play dirty like that, but I could tell he was serious, so I just got to work. Mom and Dad were supposed to be back by 7 o'clock, and we still had a ton of work to do. It wasn't easy to erase all the evidence of the party, because Roderick's friends had left trash in all these crazy places. At one point, when I went to make myself a bowl of cereal, a half-eaten piece of pizza fell out of the box. By 6.45... We had things pretty well wrapped up. I went upstairs to take a shower, and that's when I saw the message written on the inside of the bathroom door. Some moron had scrawled, Hi, Roderick. I tried scrubbing the writing off with soap and water, but whoever wrote that thing must have used a permanent marker. Mom and Dad were going to be home any minute, so I thought we were doomed. But then Roderick had a genius idea. He said we could switch the door out and replace it with a closet door from the basement. So we got some screwdrivers and went to work. We finally managed to get the door off its hinges, and then we carried it downstairs. Then we got the closet door from Roderick's room in the basement and brought it upstairs. We made it with no time to spare. Mom and Dad's car rolled into the driveway right when we were tightening the last screw. You could tell they were pretty relieved the house hadn't burned down while they were away. I don't think we're totally out of the woods just yet, because with the way Dad was poking around tonight, I'm sure it won't be long before he figures out about the party. Well, Roderick might have lucked out this time, but all I can say is he should be glad Manny wasn't there to see the party. Manny is a huge tattletale. In fact, he's been telling on me ever since he could talk. He's even told on me for stuff I did before he could talk. When I was a kid, I broke the sliding glass door in the family room. Mom and Dad didn't have any evidence that I was the one who did it, so they couldn't peg it on me, and I was in the clear. But Manny was there when it happened, and two years later, he squealed on me. He said, Bubby won't walk at Big Window. So, after Manny started talking, I had to worry about all the bad things he saw me do when he was a baby. I used to be a big tattletale myself, until I learned my lesson. One time, I told on Roderick for saying a bad word. Mom asked me which word he said, so I spelled it out. And it was a long one, too. Well, I ended up getting a bar of soap in my mouth for knowing how to spell a bad word. And Roderick got off scot-free. Monday. Tomorrow, I have an English assignment due where I have to write an allegory. That's basically a story that says one thing but means something else. 
I was having trouble getting inspired. But then I saw Roderick outside working on his van, and I got an idea. Rory Screws Up by Greg Hefley Once upon a time, there was this monkey named Rory. The family he lived with loved him very much, even though he was constantly screwing things up. One day, Rory accidentally rang the doorbell, and everybody thought he did it on purpose, so they gave him some bananas as a reward. Well, now Rory was going around thinking he was some sort of monkey genius or something, and one day he heard his owner say, My dang car is broke. So Rory's primitive mind raced to formulate a plan, and here is what he eventually came up with. Rory, fix, car. Rory worked all day and all night, and to make a long story short, the end result was not a fixed car. After it was all over, Rory had learned a very valuable lesson. Rory is a monkey, and monkeys don't fix cars. The End After I finished my paper, I showed it to Roderick. I figured he wouldn't get it, and sure enough, I was right. He only said, Monkeys don't understand English, stupid. Like I said before, Roderick knows he's got me under his thumb with this secret thing, so I have to get my licks in any way I can. Wednesday Today was Manny's first day of preschool, and apparently it didn't go so great. All the other kids at Manny's school started back in September, but Manny wasn't potty trained until last week, so that's why he had to wait until now to make the jump from daycare. Manny's preschool was having their Halloween party today, so it wasn't the greatest way to introduce him to his classmates, considering they were all wearing these scary masks. Manny's teachers had to call Mom at work and have her come get him. He was hiding on the top shelf of the coat rack. I remember my first day of preschool. I didn't really know anyone, so I was pretty scared about being around a bunch of new kids. But this boy named Quinn came right over and started talking to me. He said, Do you like ice cream? And I said, Yeah. And he said, Then why don't you marry it? I didn't get that it was a joke, so it really freaked me out. An ice cream cone for a wife? I told Mom I didn't want to go back to preschool, and I told her all about Quinn and what he said. But Mom told me Quinn was just being silly, and I didn't need to listen to him. After Mom explained the joke, I actually thought it was pretty funny. I couldn't wait to go back to school the next day and try it out myself. But I got confused and blurted, You're gonna grow up and get married to some ice cream. So it didn't really have the same effect. November Monday It's been over a week since Roderick's party, and I stopped worrying that Mom and Dad were gonna bust us for it. But remember that bathroom door we switched out? Well, I forgot all about it until tonight. Roderick was upstairs in my room bugging me, and Dad went into the bathroom. A couple seconds later, he said something that made Roderick stop cold. Hey, didn't this door used to lock? I thought it was over. If Dad knew about the door, it was just a matter of time before he found out about the party. But Dad didn't put two and two together. He just said, I must be losing my marbles. That lucky Roderick. You know, maybe it wouldn't be so bad if Mom and Dad found out about the party. Roderick would get grounded, which would be awesome. So, if I can figure out a way to spill the beans without Roderick finding out, I'm gonna go for it. Tuesday. I got my first letter from my French pen pal, Mama Du, today. I decided to adjust my attitude and give this whole pen pal thing my best effort. So when I wrote back to Mama Du today, I tried to be as helpful as possible. He had written, Dear Gregory, I am very privileged to make your acquaintance. Mama Du. 
So I wrote back, Dear Mama Do, I'm pretty sure acquaintance doesn't have a C in it. I really think you need to work on your English. Sincerely, Greg. I think it's dumb that Madame Lefrere won't let us use email with our pen pals. Albert Murphy has already written back and forth with his pen pal a bunch of times, and it's costing them a lot of money in stamps. Letter 1. Dear Jacques, how old are you? Letter 2. Dear Albert, 12. Letter 3. Dear Jacques, oh. Cost, $14. Friday. Tonight, Rowley's parents went out to dinner, so they got him a babysitter. I don't know why Rowley can't just watch himself for a few hours, but believe me, I'm not complaining. Rowley's babysitter is Heather Hills, and she's the prettiest girl at Crossland High School. So whenever the Jeffersons go out, I always make sure to be up at Rowley's for story time. I went up to Rowley's at about 8 o'clock tonight. I even splashed on some of Roderick's cologne to make sure I made a good impression on Heather. I knocked on the door and waited for Heather to answer, but I was caught a little off guard when Rowley's next-door neighbor Leland answered instead. I can't believe Rowley's parents switched babysitters from Heather to Leland. They should have at least checked with me before doing something stupid like that. Once I realized Heather wasn't there, I turned around to go back home. But Rowley asked me if I wanted to hang out and play magic and monsters with him and Leland. The only reason I said yes was because I thought it was some kind of video game. But then I found out that you play it with pencils and paper and these special dice, and that you're supposed to use your imagination or whatever. It actually turned out to be pretty fun. Mostly because in Magic and Monsters, you can do all sorts of stuff you could never do in real life. Like, light Rowley's eyebrows with a torch. When I got home, I told Mom all about Magic and Monsters, and how Leland was a really awesome dungeon keeper. Roderick overheard me talking about Leland, and he said that Leland is the biggest nerd at his high school. But this is coming from a guy who spends his Saturday nights putting fake throw-up on people's cars in the Home Depot parking lot. So I think I'll just take Roderick's opinion with a grain of salt. Wednesday I've been going up to Leland's house every day after school to play magic and monsters. I was headed up there again today when Mom stopped me at the door. Mom has been acting real suspicious of this whole magic and monsters thing. And from the questions she's been asking me, I guess she must think Leland is teaching me and Rowley witchcraft or something. So today, Mom said she wanted to go with me to Leland's to watch us play. I begged Mom not to come, because first of all, I knew she would never approve of all the violence in the game. And second of all, I knew that having her in the room would totally ruin the whole experience for everyone. When I begged Mom not to join us, it made her even more suspicious. So now there was no changing her mind. Rowley and Leland couldn't have cared less that Mom came with me. But I couldn't enjoy myself, because I felt like a total dork playing in front of her, saying things like, My wizard Talrock utters the spell of Talrune. I figured Mom would eventually get bored and just go home, but she stuck around. And right when I thought she was finally going to leave, Mom said that she wanted to join in the game. So Leland started setting up a character for Mom, even though I was trying to signal to him that it was a big mistake. When Leland created a character for Mom, Mom told Leland she wanted her character to be my character's mother in the game. I did some quick thinking and told Mom that all the characters in Magic and Monsters are orphans, so she couldn't be my mother. And Mom believed me. But then she asked Leland if she could name her character, Mom. And he said yes. I have to give Mom credit for figuring out that loophole. But it totally ruined the rest of the game for me. Even though Mom wasn't technically my mother in the game, she sure acted like she was. At this one point, our characters were hanging out in a tavern waiting for a spy to arrive, and my dwarf, Grimlon, ordered a pint of mead. 
Mead is sort of like beer in Magic and Monsters, and I guess Mom didn't approve of that. She found a way to accidentally bump Grimlon's arm and spill his drink. The worst part of the game was when we got into a battle situation. See, the whole point of Magic and Monsters is that you're supposed to kill as many monsters as possible so you can get points and move up in levels. But I don't really think Mom got that concept. When Leland announced that Mom had run into a pack of orcs and they looked hungry, she said, We give them all of our food. After about an hour of things going like this, I decided to quit. So I gathered up my stuff, and me and Mom headed home. On the way back, Mom was really talking up magic and monsters, saying how it could help me with my math skills and stuff like that. All I can say is, I hope she isn't planning on becoming a regular at these games, because the first chance I get, Mom is getting handed over to a pack of orcs. Thursday. After school today, Mom took me to the bookstore and bought just about every Magic and Monsters book on the shelf. She must have dropped about $200, and she didn't even make me cash in a single Mom buck. I realized maybe I judged Mom a little too quick, and maybe it wasn't such a bad thing having her in our group after all. I was all set to take my new books up to Leland's, but that's when I found out there was a catch. Mom actually bought all these books so me and Roderick could play Magic and Monsters together. She said it was a good way for the two of us to work out our differences. Mom told Roderick she wanted him to be the dungeon keeper, just like Leland. Then she dumped a pile of books on Roderick's bed and told him to start studying up. It was bad enough playing in front of Mom at Leland's house, but I knew playing with Roderick would be about ten times worse. Mom was serious about me and Roderick playing together, so I knew I was going to have to go through with it. I spent about an hour up in my room making up characters with names Roderick couldn't make fun of, like Joe and Bob. Once I was finished, I met Roderick in the kitchen, and we started our game. In his first move as Dungeon Keeper, Roderick said, You and your group of nerds fall into a pit, and it's full of dynamite and you blow up. The end. I guess I should be grateful that it was over with quickly. And I just hope Mom saved her receipts on those books. Friday The teachers have really been cracking down on kids copying off of each other this year. Remember how I said I was glad I got put next to Alex Aruda in pre-algebra? Well, that hasn't done me any good. Mrs. Lee is my pre-algebra teacher, and I'm guessing she also had Roderick when he was in middle school, because that woman watches me like a hawk. Sometimes, I think it would be really cool if I had a glass eye or something like that. First of all, I could use it to play all sorts of wacky tricks on my friends. But the main thing I'd use it for is to help me get better grades. On the first day of school, I'd aim my glass eye down. Then, I go up to the teacher and say, Listen, I just wanted to tell you I have a glass eye, so don't go thinking I'm looking at other people's papers. And the teacher would say, Okie doke, thanks for letting me know. Then, during a test, I'd aim my glass eye down at my own paper, and I'd look at some brainy kid's paper with my real eye. I could copy away, and the teacher would be too dumb to notice. Aw, oh, that poor glass eye kid. Unfortunately, I don't have a glass eye. So if Mom asks why I flunked my pop quiz in pre-algebra today, that's my excuse. Sunday. Roderick has been hitting Mom and Dad up for cash lately, so I guess the Mom Bucks program isn't really working out for him. Mom has tried to make Roderick do more chores to earn some money, but that hasn't been going too well. But tonight, Mom figured out a way Roderick could earn some cash. My school sent home a newsletter saying that music education has been canceled because of budget cuts, so parents should get their kids private music lessons. Mom told Roderick he could give me private drum lessons, and that she would pay him for it. 
I think Mom came up with the idea because lately, Roderick's been telling everyone he's a professional drummer. There's this local show called The Community Follies, where all the neighborhood parents do a bunch of comedy skits, and it's been running in our local theater for about two weeks. The other night, the regular drummer got sick, so Roderick filled in, and he got paid five bucks to play a rim shot on the drums after each corny joke. I don't know if that really makes Roderick a professional drummer, but that didn't stop me from using it to score points with the girls at school. Hey, girls. My brother's a professional drummer. When Mom told Roderick he should start giving me drum lessons, he wasn't too hot on the idea. But then Mom said she'd pay him $10 a lesson, and that I could get a bunch of my friends to sign up too. So now I've got to recruit some people for Roderick's Drum Academy. And I can already tell, this isn't going to be a lot of fun. Monday I couldn't get any of my friends to sign up for Roderick's drum school except Rowley, and I kind of had to trick him into doing it. Rowley is always saying he wants to learn how to play the drums, but he wants to play the kind they use in marching bands. I told Rowley I knew for a fact that Roderick was going to cover all that stuff in week four, and that got Rowley pretty excited. I was just glad I wasn't going to have to take drum lessons all by myself. Rowley came over after school and we went down to the basement to start our first lesson. Roderick started us off with some pretty basic drum drills. There was only one practice pad and two drumsticks, so Rowley had to use a paper plate and some plastic utensils. But I guess that's what happens when you're the last person to sign up for a class. After about 15 minutes, Roderick got a call from Ward, and that put an end to our first lesson. Class is dismissed early today. Mom wasn't too happy to see me and Rowley upstairs so soon, and she sent us back down to the basement. She said not to come up until Roderick had at least given us a practice assignment. So he did. He told us, Your homework is to listen to some music with drums in it. Tuesday Me and Rowley had drum lessons with Roderick again today. Well, Roderick might be a good drummer, but he's not a good teacher. Me and Rowley tried our best to do the drills Roderick taught us, but every time we messed up, Roderick would get frustrated. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Eventually, he got so fed up that he took our drumsticks away. Roderick sat down at his drum set and told us to watch and learn. Then he started doing this really long drum solo that didn't have anything to do with the drills he was teaching us. Really long. Roderick didn't even look up from his drum set when me and Rowley left and went upstairs. I'm not complaining, though, because the way I see it, this way everyone wins. We played video games while Roderick finished his drum solo. Thursday. We've got a history paper due the day before Thanksgiving, and I'd better start getting serious about it. The teachers are getting a lot stricter about the quality of work we turn in, and the way I usually do things isn't working so good anymore. Last week, we had a paper due in science, and Mrs. Breckman said we had to choose an animal to write about. So I picked the moose. I know I should have gone to the library and done research, but I just decided to wing it. The Amazing Moose by Greg Hefley Diet the moose eats many, many things. But the list would be way too long to put in this paper, so I will save us all some time by just listing the things that the moose does not eat. Bubblegum. Metal. Pizza. Even though there are moose habitats set up all over the place, the moose is almost extinct. Everybody knows the moose evolved from birds, just like people did. But somewhere along the line, people got arms, and the moose got stuck with those useless horns. The end. I actually thought I did a pretty good job, but I guess Mrs. Breckman must be an expert on mooses or something, because she made me go to the library and start the paper over from scratch. And my next paper isn't going to be any easier.
I have to write a poem about the 1900s for Mr. Huff's class, and I don't know the first thing about history or poetry. So I guess I'd better start hitting the books. Monday. I was up at Rowley's playing board games yesterday, and the craziest thing happened. When Rowley was in the bathroom, I noticed that there was some play money sticking out of the box of one of the other games. I couldn't believe my eyes, because the play money inside that game was the exact same kind of money mom uses for mom bucks. When I counted it up, there was something like $100,000 in cash in that box. It only took me about two seconds to figure out what to do next. I snagged it. When I got home, I ran upstairs and stuffed the money under my mattress. I tossed and turned all night trying to figure out what to do with my new mom bucks. I realized mom would probably have some way of knowing the difference between phony mom bucks and the real thing. So this morning, I decided to try a little experiment. I asked mom if I could cash in some mom bucks so I could buy stamps to write my pen pal. I was really nervous when I handed mom the money. But she took it without even blinking. I can't believe my luck. I figure I can make this $100,000 last all the way through high school and maybe even farther. I might not even have to get a real job later on. The trick will be not to cash in too much at one time, or mom will know something's up. And I have to remember to earn a few mom bucks for real here and there so she doesn't get too suspicious. I will say one thing for sure, though, and it's that I won't be using the money mom gave me to buy stamps. I got a picture from my pen pal, Mama Do, in the mail yesterday, and that pretty much killed any chance of me writing him back. And he calls himself Super Cool. Tuesday. My big history paper is due tomorrow, but they've been saying all week that it's going to snow about a foot tonight. So I haven't really been sweating it all that much. At around 10 o'clock, I peeked out the window to see how many inches of snow were on the ground so far. But I couldn't believe my eyes when I pulled back the curtain. Nada. Man, I was counting on school being canceled tomorrow. I turned on the news to see what happened, but the weather guy was telling a totally different story than he was three hours ago. That meant I had to get cracking on my history paper. The problem was, it was too late to go to the library, and we don't have any books in our house that are about the 1900s. So I knew I had to think of something quick. Then, I had a great idea. Dad has bailed Roderick out a million times on his school papers, so I figured he could help me, too. I told Dad about my situation, thinking he'd jump right in and help. But I guess Dad has learned his lesson in that department. He only said, Good luck with that. Roderick must have overheard me talking to Dad, because he told me I should follow him downstairs. You know how Roderick had Mr. Huff, my history teacher in middle school? Well, it turns out Mr. Huff gave Roderick's class the exact same assignment when he was in my grade. Roderick dug around in his junk drawer and found his old paper. And then he told me he'd sell it to me for five bucks. I told him there was no way I'd do that. I'll admit, it was pretty tempting. Because number one, since all of Roderick's assignments have gone through Dad, I knew Roderick got a good grade on his paper. And number two, it was in one of those clear plastic binders that teachers go crazy for. Plus, I had a huge stash of mom bucks under my mattress upstairs, and I knew I could pay Roderick with that. But I couldn't do it. I mean, I've copied off of people's papers on quizzes and stuff before, but buying a paper off of someone would be taking it to a whole nother level. So I decided I was going to just have to suck it up and do the paper myself. I started doing some research on the computer, but at about midnight, the worst possible thing happened. The power went out. That's when I knew I was in some serious trouble. I knew I'd flunk history if I didn't turn in a paper. So even though I didn't want to, 
I decided to take Roderick up on his offer. I scraped together $500 in mom bucks and went down to the basement. But Roderick didn't let me off that easy. His fee had gone up. Roderick told me his new price was $20,000 in mom bucks. I told him I didn't have it. So he just rolled over and went back to sleep. At that point, I was really desperate. So I went upstairs and grabbed a big handful of $1,000 bills and brought them down to Roderick's room. I gave him the money, and he turned over the paper. I felt really bad about what I did, but I just tried not to think about it and went to sleep. Wednesday. On the bus ride to school, I took Roderick's paper out of my bag. But I took one look at it and knew something was seriously wrong. First of all, the poem wasn't typed out. It was in Roderick's own handwriting. That's when it hit me. Dad only started doing Roderick's papers for him once he got to high school. So that meant this paper was Roderick's own work. I started reading Roderick's paper to see if I could still use it. But apparently, Roderick was even worse about doing his research than me. A Hundred Years Ago by Roderick Hefley Sometimes I sit and wonder about stuff I don't know. Like what the heck the earth was like a hundred years ago. Did cavemen ride on dinosaurs? Did flowers even grow? Well, we could guess, but that was back a hundred years ago. I wish they built a time machine and they picked me to go to check out what the scene was like a hundred years ago. Did giant spiders rule the earth? Were deserts filled with snow? I wonder what the story was. A hundred years ago. At the bottom, the teacher wrote, F. See me. I guess I learned my lesson about buying a paper off someone. Or at least off of Roderick. When third period rolled around, I didn't have anything to turn into Mr. Huff. I guess that means I'll be taking summer school for history. And my day got a whole lot worse after that. When I got home from school, Mom was waiting for me at the front door. You know that stack of bills I paid Roderick with? Well, he tried to cash them all in at once to get money for a used motorcycle. I'm sure Mom knew something was fishy since Roderick has never earned a single mom buck on his own. Roderick told mom where he got the money, and she dug around my room until she found my stash under the mattress. Mom knew she never put $100,000 into circulation, so she confiscated all my cash, even the ones I earned for real. I guess that's the end of the mom bucks program. To be honest with you, I'm kind of relieved. Sleeping on that pile of cash every night was really stressing me out. Mom was mad that I tried to put one over on her like that, so she gave me a punishment. But I got that out of the way before dinner, by making Rowley help me clean out the garage. Thursday. Today was Thanksgiving, and it started off like it always does, with Aunt Loretta showing up two hours early. Mom always makes me and Roderick entertain Aunt Loretta, and that means talk to her until the rest of the family shows up. The biggest fights me and Roderick have ever had were over who has to greet her first. The rest of the family started trickling in around 11 o'clock. Dad's brother, Uncle Joe, and his kids were the last ones to show up around 12.30. Uncle Joe's kids all called Dad the same thing. Aunt Frank. Mom thinks it's really cute, but Dad swears that Uncle Joe tells his kids to do it on purpose. Things are pretty tense between Dad and Uncle Joe, because Dad is still mad at Uncle Joe for something he did last Thanksgiving. Back then, Manny had just started potty training, and he was doing pretty good. In fact, he was probably about two weeks from being out of diapers. But Uncle Joe said something to Manny that changed everything. Better look out for the potty monster, little fella. 
It was six months before Manny would even step foot in the bathroom again. Every time Dad changed a dirty diaper after that, I heard him cursing Uncle Joe under his breath. We had dinner around two o'clock, and then people went into the living room to talk. I didn't feel like talking, so I went in the family room to play video games. Eventually, I guess Dad had enough of the family, too, so he went downstairs to work on his Civil War battlefield. But he forgot to lock the door to the furnace room, and Uncle Joe walked in after him. Uncle Joe seemed pretty interested in what Dad was working on, so Dad told him all about it. Dad gave Uncle Joe this big speech about the 150th Regiment and the role it played at Gettysburg, and spent about a half hour describing the whole battle. But I don't think Uncle Joe was really listening to Dad's speech. He sort of insulted Dad by saying, Nice toys, big brother. Thanksgiving didn't last too much longer after that. Dad went upstairs and turned up the thermostat until it got stuffy and everyone cleared out. And that's pretty much how Thanksgiving ends every year at our house. December. Saturday. You remember how I said Mom and Dad were going to eventually find out about Roderick's party? Well, it finally happened today. Mom sent Dad out to pick up the pictures from Thanksgiving, and when Dad got back, you could tell he wasn't happy about something. The picture in Dad's hand was from Roderick's party. It looked like one of Roderick's friends accidentally took a picture with Mom's camera, which she keeps on the shelf above the stereo. And when he took the picture, it captured the whole scene. Roderick tried to deny that he had a party, but everything was right there in the picture, so there really wasn't any point. Mom and Dad took away Roderick's car keys and told him his punishment is that he's not allowed to leave the house for a whole month. They were even mad at me, because they said I was Roderick's accomplice. So I got hit with a two-week video game ban. Sunday. Mom and Dad have been all over Roderick's case ever since they found out about his party. Roderick usually sleeps until 2 o'clock in the afternoon on weekends, but today, Dad made Roderick get out of bed by 8 a.m. Making Roderick get out of bed early is a pretty big blow to him because Roderick loves to sleep. One time last fall, Roderick slept for 36 hours straight. He slept all the way from Sunday night until Tuesday morning, and he didn't even realize he missed a whole day of his life until Tuesday night, when Monday night football wasn't on. But it looks like Roderick has found a way around the new 8 o'clock rule. Now, when Dad tells Roderick to get out of bed, Roderick just drags his stuff upstairs with him and he sleeps on the couch until it's time for dinner. So I guess you gotta give this round to Roderick. Tuesday. Mom and Dad are going away again this weekend, and they're dropping me and Roderick off at Grandpa's. They said they were gonna let us stay home, but we proved we can't be trusted on our own. Grandpa lives over in Leisure Towers, which is this old folks' home. I had to spend a week there with Roderick a few months ago, and it was the low point of my whole summer. Manny is staying with Grandma this weekend, and I'd give anything to trade places with him. Grandma always has her fridge stocked with soda and cake and stuff like that, and she has cable TV with all the movie channels. The reason Manny is going to Grandma's is because Manny is Grandma's favorite, and all you need to do is take one look at her refrigerator for the proof. There's pictures of Manny all over the door. But if anyone ever accuses Grandma of showing favorites, she gets all defensive, saying, I love all my grandchildren the same. And it's not just the pictures on the fridge, either. Grandma has Manny's drawings and stuff hanging up all over the house. The only thing that Grandma has from me is this note I wrote her when I was six. I was mad at her because she wouldn't give me any ice cream before dinner. So here's what I wrote. I hate you, Grandma. Grandma has kept that note all these years, and she's still holding it over my head, telling everyone who comes into the house, 
and this is what my wonderful grandson Gregory made for me. I guess every grandparent has their favorite, and I can understand that. But at least Grandpa is up front about it. The best part is, I'm the one who is his favorite. Saturday. Well, Mom and Dad dumped me and Roderick off at Grandpa's today, just like they said they were going to do. I started looking for ways to entertain myself, but there's nothing in Grandpa's condo that's fun to do. So I just sat down with him and watched TV. But Grandpa doesn't even watch real shows. He just keeps his TV tuned to the security camera that's in the front lobby of his building. And after a few hours of that, you start to go a little nuts, listening to Grandpa say things like, Oh, sure, Barry Grossman has time to go out for a three-hour walk, but he doesn't have time to return my vacuum. At about five o'clock, Grandpa made us dinner. Grandpa makes this awful thing called watercress salad. And it's the worst thing you ever tasted. It's basically a bunch of cold green beans and cucumbers floating in a pool of vinegar. Roderick knows I hate watercress salad more than anything. So the last time we stayed at Grandpa's, Roderick made sure to pile it on my plate, saying, Greg loves watercress salad. I had to sit there and choke down every bite so Grandpa's feelings wouldn't be hurt. And guess what I got as a reward for cleaning my plate? More watercress salad. Tonight, Grandpa gave us our salad, and I acted like I was going to eat it. But then I just stuffed it all in my pocket when no one was looking. It felt pretty disgusting when the cold vinegar started running down my leg. But believe me, it was about a thousand times better than having to eat it. After dinner, the three of us went into the living room. Grandpa has all these really old board games, and he always makes me and Roderick play them with him. He has this one game called Gut Busters, where one player reads a card, and the other player tries not to laugh. I always beat Grandpa, mostly because the jokes don't make any sense to me. Stuff like, Putting economic policy before fiscal responsibility is like putting the cart before the horse. That one always gets him. I always beat Roderick, too. But that's because Roderick loses on purpose. Whenever it's my turn to read a card, he makes sure he has a big mouthful of milk. Then he laughs in my direction. At ten o'clock, I was ready for bed. But Roderick called the couch, and that meant I had to sleep with Grandpa again. All I can say is, if Mom and Dad were trying to teach me a lesson for covering for Roderick, well, mission accomplished. Grandpa actually handed me his teeth and asked me to put them in the glass on the bedside table. Yuck. Sunday. Roderick has a big science fair project due right before Christmas break, and it looks like Mom and Dad are making Roderick do this one all by himself. Last year... Roderick's science project was called Does Watching Violent Movies Make People Think Violent Thoughts? I guess the idea was to have people watch horror movies and then draw pictures afterward to show how the movies affected them. But it was really just an excuse for Roderick and his friends to watch a bunch of horror movies on school nights. Roderick's friends got the movie-watching part done, but they didn't draw a single picture. And the night before the science fair, Roderick didn't have anything to show for himself. So me, Mom, and Dad had to bail Roderick out. Dad typed up the paper, Mom made the poster board stuff, and I had to draw a bunch of pictures. I did my best to imagine what teenagers would draw after watching violent movies. Skulls with knives in them, burning buildings being attacked by airplanes with missiles. The thing that really stinks is that I caught heat from Mom when she saw my drawings, because she said they were disturbing. And that's why I was only allowed to watch G-rated movies for the rest of the year. But if you want to talk about disturbing, you should have seen some of the stuff Manny was coming up with those days. One night, Roderick accidentally left one of his horror movies in the DVD player. And when Manny went to turn on cartoons the next day, he got Roderick's movie instead. 
I came across a couple of Manny's drawings after that, and some of them were enough to give me nightmares. Tuesday Mom and Dad set up due dates for Roderick on his science fair project, and by six o'clock tonight, he was supposed to tell them the theme of his experiment. But at 6.45, things weren't looking so good. Roderick was watching a show about astronauts and what happens to them after they've been up in space for a long time. The show said that when the astronauts get back to Earth, they're actually taller than when they left. And the reason is because there's no gravity in space, so their spines decompress or something. Well, that gave Roderick the idea he was looking for. Roderick told Mom and Dad he was going to do his science experiment on the effect of zero gravity on the human spine. And from the way Roderick was talking it up, you'd think the results of his experiment were going to benefit mankind. Dad seemed pretty impressed. Or maybe he was just relieved that Roderick actually came through on his first task. But I think Dad started to see things a little different later on. When he found Roderick laid out on the couch and told him to take the trash out to the curb. But Roderick said he couldn't because he was doing his research. Wednesday. Yesterday at school, they announced tryouts for the big winter talent show. As soon as I found out about it, I came up with this awesome idea for a comedy skit that me and Rowley could do. But I admit the real reason I wrote it was to give myself an excuse to talk to Holly Hills, who is Heather Hills' sister, and the most popular girl in my grade. It's called The Boy Whose Family Thinks He's a Dog. And here's the script. Me, as the dad. Look, honey, our dog is standing on its hind legs. Rowley, as the boy. I am a person, not a dog. Holly, as the mom. Hey, you're not supposed to be up on the couch, you dumb mutt. Rowley, but I'm not a dog. I'm your son. Holly, don't you growl at me. Me, we're off on a romantic vacation. I guess we'll have to put you in the kennel. Rowley, but I want to go with you guys. Me, well, woof, woof, woof to you too. The End Credits Writer, Greg Heffley. Director, Greg Heffley. Dad, Greg Heffley. Mom, Holly Hills. Dog Boy, Rowley Jefferson. I showed Rowley the script, but he wasn't too enthusiastic about the idea. You'd think Rowley would be grateful that I was going to make him a big star. But like Mom always says, there are some people you just can't please. Thursday. Rowley went and found someone else to partner with for the talent show. He's going to do a magic act with this kid from his karate class named Scotty Douglas. And if you want to know if I'm jealous, let me put it to you this way. Scotty Douglas is in the first grade. So Rowley will be lucky if he doesn't get beat up at school for this. They're having one big talent show for the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school. So that means Roderick and his band are going to be in the same competition as Rowley and Scotty Douglas. Roderick's all fired up about the talent show. His band has never played in front of a crowd, so they see this as their big chance to get noticed. Roderick is still grounded, but the rule is that he's not allowed to leave the house so his band just comes over every day and practices down in the basement. I think Dad's starting to wish he had worded Roderick's punishment a little differently. But if Roderick's band really thinks they can win this talent show, they better get serious and play some actual music, because they spent their last two practices fooling around with a new echo pedal they got over the weekend. I kept hearing, Somebody farted, 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 farted. Friday. Dad ended Roderick's punishment two weeks early, because he was going bonkers listening to loaded diaper practice every day. So tonight, Roderick went to his friend Ward's for the weekend. With Roderick out of the house, that meant the basement was free, 
so I invited Rowley over to spend the night. Me and Rowley bought a bunch of candy and soda, and Rowley brought over his portable TV. We even managed to get our hands on a couple of Roderick's horror movies, so we were all set. But then, Mom came downstairs with Manny. She said, Look who came to join you. Rats. The only reason Mom dumped Manny on us was so he could spy and tell her if we were doing anything wrong. Every single time I've had a sleepover, Manny has ruined it. The last time Rowley slept over was the worst. Manny must have gotten cold in the middle of the night, so he crawled into Rowley's sleeping bag to get warm. That freaked Rowley out enough to make him go home early. And he hasn't been back to spend the night ever since. It looked like Manny was going to ruin another sleepover. Me and Rowley couldn't watch our horror movies with Manny around, so we decided to just play board games instead. But I'm a little sick of board games. And besides, Rowley was kind of driving me crazy. He needed to go to the bathroom every five minutes, and whenever he'd come back downstairs, he'd kick a pillow across the room, saying, Booyah! It might have been funny the first couple of times, but then it really started getting on my nerves. So the next time Rowley went upstairs to use the bathroom, I played a prank on him. I put one of Dad's dumbbells underneath a pillow. And sure enough, the next time Rowley came downstairs, he gave it a big kick. Well, that did it. Rowley started blubbering like a baby, and I couldn't quiet him down. And with all the racket Rowley was making, Mom came downstairs. Mom took a look at Rowley's big toe, and she seemed pretty concerned. I think Mom's sensitive about Rowley getting injured in our house after the tinfoil ball incident. So she drove him right home. I was just glad she didn't ask us how it happened. As soon as Mom and Rowley walked out the door, I knew I'd better start working on Manny. Manny saw me put that dumbbell under the pillow, and I knew he would tell Mom what I did. So I came up with an idea to keep him from snitching. I packed some bags and told Manny I was going to run away from home so I didn't have to face Mom for what I did. Then I walked out the door and acted like I was leaving for good. Goodbye, oh family. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. I got that idea from Roderick. He used to pull the same kind of thing on me when he did something bad, and he knew I was going to tell on him. He would act like he was running away, and then five minutes later, he would just walk back inside. And by that time, I was ready to forgive him for whatever he did. So after I told Manny I was leaving home, I shut the door and waited outside for a few minutes. And when I opened the door, I expected to find him crying in the foyer. But Manny wasn't where I left him. I started walking around the house looking for him. And guess where he was? Down in the basement, eating my candy. Anyway, if letting Manny eat my candy is the price I have to pay to keep him quiet, I can live with it. Saturday. After I woke up this morning, I went down to the kitchen. But one look at Mom's face told me that Manny sold me out. Manny told Mom everything. He even told her about our horror movies. Don't even ask me how he knew about that. Mom made me call Rowley to apologize. But then she made me talk to his parents and apologize to them, too. So I don't think I'm going to get invited back over to Rowley's house anytime soon. Then, Mom got on the phone with Mrs. Jefferson. Mrs. Jefferson said Rowley's big toe was broken and that he had to stay off it for a week. Then, Mrs. Jefferson said Rowley is heartbroken because this means he'll have to miss the talent show tryouts, and he's been practicing his magic act with Scotty Douglas all week. So Mom told Mrs. Jefferson that I would be happy to fill in for Rowley at the tryouts. I started tugging at Mom's sleeve to let her know this was a terrible idea. But of course, she just ignored me. After Mom got off the phone, I told her the last thing I needed at school is to be on stage doing magic tricks with a kid who was in pull-ups a year ago. But Mom made me go through with it anyway. She took me down to Scotty's house and explained the situation to his mother. 
so now there was no getting out of it. Mrs. Douglas invited me inside, and me and Scotty went up to his room to start practicing. Well, the first thing I found out was that Rowley and Scotty were not equal partners in this act. Rowley was actually Scotty's assistant. I told Scotty there was no way I was going to be a magician's assistant to a first grader. But Scotty said it was his magic set, and he started throwing a big tantrum. So I just went along with the idea to keep Scotty quiet, because believe me, I did not need any more trouble. Then Scotty handed me this shirt that was covered with all these sparkly sequins, and he told me that it was my costume. It looked like something Grandma would wear to bingo. I told Scotty maybe I could wear something cooler, like a leather jacket, but he said that wouldn't be magic enough. Anyway, it turns out all I have to do for the act is hand Scotty a prop every once in a while, so maybe it really isn't going to be all that bad. But ask me how I feel again if we get in and have to perform on stage in front of 500 people instead of Scotty's baby sister. Sunday. I'll tell you one good thing that's come out of practicing this magic act with Scotty Douglas. It's given me a bunch of good ideas for more Creighton the Cretan comics. Rowley quit doing his comic strip, Zoo Wee Mama, for the school paper a few months ago because he said he wanted to have more time to play with his Dino Blazer action figures. That means the cartoonist job is open again, and maybe I have a shot. Monday. Well, good news on the talent show. The tryouts were today, and me and Scotty didn't make it in. Okay, so maybe I could have done a better job as Scotty's assistant, but I didn't blow it on purpose. I just forgot to hand him his props once or twice. And read a newspaper while we were on stage. We were the only ones who didn't make the cut, and that actually is kind of embarrassing. I know we weren't exactly the best act trying out today, but we weren't the worst either. Some of the acts that got in were a lot lamer than our magic act. This kindergartner named Harry Gilbertson made the cut, and all he did was roller skate figure eights around a boombox that was playing Yankee Doodle Dandy. Roderick's band made it in too, and he's acting like that's some huge accomplishment. Like I said before, Roderick is really excited about the Winter Talent Show. In fact, he actually got his science fair project done a day early so he could squeeze in some extra band practices before the big night. But when Roderick turned in his project, his science teacher told him he was going to have to start over and come up with a whole new idea. He said that Roderick didn't use the scientific method with a hypothesis and a conclusion and all that. Roderick told the teacher he actually grew a sixteenth of an inch during his zero gravity experiment, so that proved he was onto something. But his teacher said that's a normal amount for a boy Roderick's age to grow in a month. Well, this really stinks for me, because I had decided to do my science fair project on zero gravity, too. And now it looks like all the research I did watching Roderick sleep was just a big waste of time. Dad told Roderick he's going to have to just skip the talent show so he can do a new experiment. But Roderick says he's not going to do it. Roderick told Dad he doesn't care about school anymore. He said his plan is to win the talent show and use the tape of the performance to get signed to a record label. Then he'll quit school and just do the band full time. It sounds like a terrible plan to me. But I think Dad is pretty open to the idea, if it gets Roderick out of the house. Wednesday. Tonight was the big winter talent show. I didn't want to go, and neither did Dad. But Mom made us both go to show our support for Roderick. Roderick and Mom went to the school early to bring some stuff that Roderick's band needed. So Dad had to ride in the band's van with Bill. And Dad wasn't too thrilled when he ran into his boss in the school parking lot. The show kicked off at 7 o'clock. And let me just say, I think it was a really bad idea to combine the three schools for this thing. They ended up having kindergartners singing songs to their teddy bears followed by 18-year-olds doing speed metal guitar solos, 
like Larry Larkin's performance of Carnage. I don't think Dad approved of Larry Larkin and all his piercings. Halfway through Larry's guitar solo, Dad leaned over and whispered to the man sitting next to him, What's the worst thing that kid up there could say to you? I wish I had time to warn Dad that that guy he was talking to was Larry's father. Yup, you guessed it. Dad's answer to what's the worst thing that kid could say to you was, Hi, Dad. Oops. Another problem with combining the schools was that there were too many acts, and the show went on forever. At 9.30, they decided to start running two acts at the same time to keep the show moving along. Sometimes it worked out all right, like when they had Patty Farrell tap dancing while Spencer Kitt was juggling. But other times, it didn't work out too good, like when Terrence James played a harmonica on a unicycle while Charisse Klein read her poem about global warming. Roderick's band was the last act to take the stage. Before the show, Roderick asked me to videotape his band during their act, but I told him, no way. He's been such a jerk to me lately that I can't believe he was trying to hit me up for a favor. So Mom volunteered for camera duty. Roderick's band got paired up with Harry Gilbertson, the roller skating kid, and I'm sure Roderick wasn't too happy about that. I noticed Dad wasn't sitting next to me while Roderick's band played, so I looked around for him. Dad was standing in the back of the gym with cotton balls sticking out of his ears, and he stayed there until the song was over. After Roderick's band performed, they handed out the awards. Roderick's band didn't win anything, but Harry Gilbertson walked away with a prize for Best Musical Act. Go figure. But you'll never guess who the grand prize winner was. Rowley's babysitter, Leland. He won for his ventriloquist act, because the judges said it was wholesome. I never thought I'd agree with Roderick on anything, but I'm starting to wonder if maybe he was right about Leland being a nerd after all. After the show, Roderick's band came back to our house to watch the videotape of their performance. They were all grumbling about how they got robbed, and how the judges don't know the first thing about rock and roll. So their plan was to just mail the videotape off to some record labels and let their performance speak for itself. They all sat down in front of the TV, and Roderick put the tape in the machine. But it took about 30 seconds for everyone to realize the tape was worthless. You know how Roderick asked Mom to videotape the show? Well, she did a pretty good job of filming. But she talked nonstop during the first two minutes and the camera picked up every little comment she made. Things like, that shirt makes Roderick's arms look so skinny. Every time Bill stuck out his tongue and flicked it up and down like a rock star, you could hear Mom ring in with her opinion. I don't like that. In fact, the only time Mom stopped talking was when Roderick did his drum solo. But during that part, the camera was shaking around so much that you couldn't even see anything. At first, Roderick and his bandmates were really mad. But then one of them remembered that the school taped the talent show, and it's supposed to be on the local cable channel tomorrow night. I guess that means they'll all be coming back over to watch that. Thursday. Well, things have gotten really bad for me in the last few hours. Roderick and his bandmates came over around 7 o'clock tonight to watch the talent show on TV. They sat through the whole three-hour show until their band came on. The school actually did a decent job of taping the performance, and things were looking pretty good, up until Roderick's drum solo. That's when Mom started dancing. And whoever was doing the filming zoomed right in on Mom and kept the camera pointed at her for the rest of the song. That meant Roderick didn't have anything he could send to record companies. And he was really mad about it, too. At first, he was mad at Mom for messing things up. But Mom said that if Roderick didn't want people to dance, he shouldn't play music. Then, Roderick turned on me. He said this was all my fault, because if I just taped the show like he asked me to, none of this would have happened. But I told him that maybe if he wasn't such a jerk, 
I would have done it for him. We started to yell at each other. Mom and Dad broke us up, and then they sent Roderick down to his room and me up to mine. But a couple of hours later, I went downstairs and I ran into Roderick in the kitchen. He was smiling, so I knew something was up. Roderick told me my secret was out. At first, I didn't know what he was talking about. But then I got it. He was talking about the thing that happened to me this summer. I ran down to the basement, and I picked up Roderick's phone to see if he had made any calls. And sure enough, it looked like he had called every friend of his who had a brother or sister my age. By tomorrow morning, everyone at my school will know the story. And I'm sure Roderick exaggerated the facts to make the story sound even worse. Now that my secret's out there, I want to put on record what really happened, and not Roderick's twisted version. So here it goes. Over the summer, me and Roderick had to stay with Grandpa at his condo in Leisure Towers for a few days. But there was nothing to do, and I was going bonkers. I was so bored, I broke out my old journal and started to write in it. But taking out a book that said diary on the cover in front of Roderick was a huge mistake. Roderick stole my journal and made a run for it. He probably would have made it into the bathroom and locked the door if someone hadn't left the Gutbusters game sitting out. He tripped right over it. I scooped the book off the floor and ran out into the hallway and down the stairwell. Then, I ducked into the bathroom in the main lobby and locked myself in a stall. I kept my feet off the floor so that if Roderick came in, he wouldn't know I was in there. I knew that if Roderick got a hold of my journal, it would be a nightmare. So I decided to just rip the whole thing into tiny little pieces and flush them down the toilet. It was better to just destroy the thing than risk Roderick getting his hands on it. But as soon as I started ripping pages out of the book, I heard the bathroom door open. I thought it was Roderick, so I just stayed completely still. I didn't hear anything, so I peeked over the top of the stall to see what was going on. That's when I saw a woman standing in front of the mirror putting on makeup. I figured the lady just accidentally wandered into the men's room, because people at Leisure Towers are always doing stuff like that. I was about to speak up and tell this lady she was in the wrong bathroom. But right then, someone else walked in. And guess what? It was another woman. That's when I realized that I was the one who messed up. And I was in the women's bathroom. I prayed that those ladies would just wash their hands and leave so I could make a run for it. But they sat down in the stalls on either side of me. And every time one woman would leave the bathroom, someone else would come in and take their place. So I couldn't leave. I just cowered on top of the toilet in my stall. If Rowley thinks he had it bad when those kids made him eat the cheese, he should try being stuck in the Leisure Tower's ladies' room for an hour and a half. I guess someone eventually heard me in there, and they reported me to the front desk. Within a few minutes, word got around the building that there was a peeping Tom in the women's room. By the time security came in and got me out of there, everyone who lived in Leisure Towers was down in the lobby. And Roderick saw the whole thing unfold upstairs on Grandpa's TV. Now that the story was out, I knew I couldn't show my face at school. So I told Mom she was going to have to transfer me somewhere else, and I told her why. Mom said I shouldn't worry about what other people think. She told me that my classmates would understand that I had just made an honest mistake. So that just proves once and for all that Mom doesn't understand a thing about kids my age. Now I'm kicking myself for not keeping up my pen pal relationship with Mama Du. Because if me and him had stayed in touch, maybe I could have gone to France as an exchange student and hid out there for a few years. All I know is, the one place I don't want to go tomorrow is school. And it looks like that's exactly where I'm headed. Friday. The craziest thing happened today. When I walked in the door at school, a bunch of guys cornered me, and I braced myself for the teasing to start. But instead of harassing me, 
they started congratulating me. Everyone was shaking my hand and patting me on the back, and I didn't know what was going on. With all those guys talking to me at the same time, it took me a while to make sense of anything. But here's what must have happened. The story Roderick told his friends got passed on to their brothers and sisters, and then they told their friends. But by the time word spread around, all the details got totally messed up. So the story went from me accidentally walking into the women's bathroom at Leisure Towers to me infiltrating the girls' locker room at Crossland High School. I couldn't believe everything got twisted like that, but I wasn't about to set the record straight either. All of the sudden, I was the hero at school. I even got a nickname. People were calling me the Stealthinator. Someone even made me a Stealthinator headband. And you better believe I wore it. Things like this never happened to me, so I wasn't going to pass up my moment of glory. And for the first time ever, I knew what it felt like to be the most popular kid at school. Unfortunately, the girls weren't as impressed with me as the guys were. In fact, I think I might have a little trouble getting someone to go to the Valentine's dance with me. Monday. You know how Roderick wanted his band to get noticed? Well, he kind of got his wish, because everybody knows who Loaded Diaper is now. I guess somebody must have thought the tape of Mom cutting loose at the talent show was pretty funny, because it's all over the internet. And now everyone knows Roderick Hefley as the drummer from the Dancing Mom video. Ever since, Roderick's been hiding out in the basement, waiting for the whole thing to blow over. And I have to admit, I do feel kind of sorry for him. I'm getting teased about the video at school, too. But at least I'm not in it. And even though Roderick can be a huge jerk sometimes, he is my brother. Tomorrow is the science fair, and if Roderick doesn't turn in a project, he's going to flunk out of school. So that's why I offered to help him out with his project. But just this one last time. We worked together all night, and I don't mean to brag, but we did a really good job. His new project is called, Do Plants Sneeze? Anyway, when Roderick gets first prize tomorrow and passes science, I just hope he realizes how lucky he is to have a brother like me. The End